Have you ever been homesick? I mean, really homesick. You know, maybe it was when you were a kid and your parents were allowing you to go on your very first sleepover. But suddenly you find yourself on some strange floor, sleeping next to your buddy, longing for your bed at home. Or maybe it's when you went off to college and you ate that first meal at the college cafeteria. Yeah, you were hoping for mom's home-cooked meal. Instead, you were left with meatloaf from the university. No, thank you. You know, I love watching people get reunited, especially watching military family members who have been separated for many months and they surprise their kids at school or their wife at her work, or maybe when you see those dogs reunited with a family member that they hadn't seen in a long time because they were off at war. I mean, there is something about those reunions, about being in the place and with the people that you just love. And Psalm 84, it's really kind of one of those pilgrimage songs, but it's it's not in the pilgrimage section. It's right here in book three, and it's going to answer the joy of the Lord with the longing to be with him. And so it's going to give us a picture of that. And this psalm here really shows us the importance of hoping for heaven and having a longing for our home in heaven and, and a desire, I mean, a deep-seated desire to dwell with God. You know, God has always designed it for us to be with Him. He's designed it for us to be in fellowship and communion and relationship with Him. That is a significant difference than any other world religion that you're going to find. This is a loving God that longs to be in relationship with His people. And if you'll look back all the way from Eden to Revelation, there has been this thread of God being with his people. As he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, and even after we sinned and they took that fruit and rebelled against God and were cast out of the garden, God still met humanity along the way. You saw how the people of God, that they would take the Ark of the Covenant, the dwelling place of God, they would take it in the tabernacle with them as they traveled, and King David would bring it to Mount Zion, and his son Solomon would build the temple, and so that God would be with his people there. And after the temple, we see that Jesus Christ came and the incarnate God in flesh was dwelling among his people. And as he lived that sinless life, died on the cross and rose again, but then ascended to heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit, the presence of God, to be with us. And there's this longing that we see in Revelation for an eternity with God. I mean, he's always had that planned out. Just look with me in Genesis chapter 1. Look how God designs it from the very beginning. We want to take these little snapshots along the way throughout the historical record of the Word of God with his interactions with us of spending time with us. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And they will rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the livestock and the whole earth and the creatures that crawl on the earth. Verse 27 says, So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God, and he created them male and female. God designed us with his image to be reflectors of that character, and he designed us to be communal with him, to be in relationship with him. After that fall, we saw the tabernacle being established to go with the people of God, being led by the cloud during the day and being led by the fire at night. I mean, we see all throughout scripture this 
presence of God guiding his people, being with his people. And then finally, we get to see Solomon erect and build the temple, the vision that his father had being passed down to him. King David was not able to accomplish that, but his son Solomon was. And there's this great detail that would be put into and and established to build the temple, this permanent dwelling place, this location. If you turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 6, I, I want to read this construction here. In verse 1 it says, Then Solomon said, The Lord said he would dwell in total darkness, but I have built an exalted temple for you, a place for your dwelling forever. Then the king turned and blessed the entire congregation of Israel while they were standing. He said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He spoke directly to my father David, and he has fulfilled the promise by his power, he said. Since the day I brought my people Israel out of the land of Egypt, I have not chosen a city to build a temple in among any of the tribes of Israel so that my name would be there. And I have not chosen a man to be ruler over my people of Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem so that my name will be there. And I have chosen David to be over my people, the people of Israel. My father David had in his heart set on a building, a temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. However, the Lord said to my father David, since it was your desire to build a temple for my name, you have done well here to do so and to fulfill that desire. Yet you are not the one to build the temple, but your son, your own offspring, will build the temple for my name. Verse 10, so the Lord has fulfilled what he has promised. I have taken the place of my father David, and I sit on the throne of Israel. As the Lord promised, I have built the temple for the name of the Lord, the Lord God of Israel. I have put the ark there where the Lord's covenant is. His testimony, the testament, his covenant being placed there where he has been made with the Israelites. The Lord's covenant is that it is made with the Israelites. Verse 12, Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the entire congregation of Israel and spread out his hands. For Solomon had made bronze platforms seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and four and a half feet high. He put it in the court and he stood on it. He knelt down in front of the entire congregation of Israel and he spread out his hands towards heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth who keeps his gracious covenant with your servants who walk before you with all their heart. You have kept what you promised to your servant, my father David. You spoke directly to him and you fulfilled your promise by your power as it is today. Therefore, Lord God of Israel, keep what you promised to your servant, my father David. You will never fail to have a man sit before me on the throne of Israel, if only your sons take care to walk in my law as you have walked before me. Now, Lord God of Israel, please confirm what you promised to your servant David. But will God live on earth with human hands? Even heaven, the highest heaven, cannot contain you, much less the temple I have built. Listen to your servant's prayer and this petition, Lord my God, so that you may hear the cry and the prayer of your servant that he prays before you, so that your eyes watch over this temple day and night towards the place where you said it would, you would put your name, and so that you may hear the prayer of your servant as your servant prays towards this place. Hear the petitions of your servant and your people Israel, which they pray towards this place. May you hear in your dwelling place in heaven. May you hear and forgive. Wow, what a great passage of Scripture we see here in 2 Chronicles. We see this dedication of the temple to the Lord, this construction, the erection of the temple, a dwelling place for God and for the people of God to be in a right relationship with Him so that they could walk with the Lord this way. I mean, I tell you, the construction of this temple was no small task. Thousands of people were involved on this project. It took around 70 years to complete it. There were 70,000 who bore burdens. 80,000 worked in the quarry on the hills. 3,600 were overseers of the work. 
in essence, no expense was spared in building this temple. The people worked so hard on behalf of this vision. They did it with excellence, and it was magnificent. And all this was done after God placed this longing in David's heart so that the temple could be erected, so that they could walk in that right relationship with him and worship the Lord God Almighty. But Solomon realized that this temple that was constructed by hands of men, directed by God, but yet still constructed by men, that it could not contain the full presence of God. He picked up on it. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, he says, But will God indeed just live on earth? Even heaven, the highest heaven, cannot contain you, much less this temple that I have built. Solomon understood that God was higher than that, and greater than that. And his power and his presence even exceeded that location. And he knew in his heart that there was a longing, I see, to be with the Lord. Uh, thanks be to Jesus that he would come after the temple would be destroyed, after 400 years of silence from any prophetic word, after all hope seemed to be lost. He would come in and his presence here on earth would be established. The very God who created the earth is going to step into it as Jesus. In John chapter 1 verse 1, it tells us this story of God coming in. Just like in Genesis of the beginning, in the beginning, it says, was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Alistair Begg put it here this way. He says this here. He says, the Word of God is God at work. See, God at work was Him establishing Himself as the Messiah here on earth. For those people, they got to walk and talk and be with Jesus. The very living Word of God present among them. Verse 14 of chapter 1 in John says, The Word of God have become flesh and dwell among us. This Word that was there at the beginning now steps in and dwells among us. The very work of God is the Word of God. And we observe His glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus comes to dwell among the people. See that? It says the Word of God dwelt among us. That is the same word that we see here in the Old Testament. It's the word that means to tabernacle with. To dwell is to tabernacle with. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm coming to dwell with you. And he had a greater plan in mind to do the Father's will so that we could have a relationship with God today. It was his life and his sacrifice and his conquering of death that gives us an opportunity to be in a right relationship with God. God now can dwell within us because of Jesus. Because of Jesus, we can worship the Father through the Son by the enabling of His Holy Spirit that lives in us. That's what Ephesians chapter 2, verses 18 through 22 tells us. It says, For through Him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members 
of God's household. Verse 20 says that we are built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone of that building. In him, this whole building, it's being put together. It grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. Yes, friends, we're now the temple of the living God, where the spirit of God dwells in us. We can be with God. We can dwell with God. And ultimately, we'll get to experience the fullness of his glory in heaven and the fullness of that presence of his glory shining on us. Look at Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. We know the end of the story. It says, Then John saw this new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice From the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and He will live with them. They will be His peoples, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Oh, I look forward to that dwelling place. I look forward, as verse 3 says, that. God will dwell with humanity for all of eternity for those who have been found with Christ in them. Oh, thank you, Lord, for that picture. And it's with that foundation, with that understanding, that we turn to now look to Psalm 84. Because in Psalm 84, there is a longing to be in the house of the Lord. As we've sang before, there is joy to be in the house of the Lord. And it's better to be in the house of the Lord for just one moment than any other experience we could have. That is the ultimate. And so in Psalm 84, these sons of Korah, these descendants of Korah, these descendants of a rebellious man who was put out by God, Their legacy of redemption being redeemed back by God to orchestrate music and worship for the people of God is a beautiful picture here that they would write a psalm like this, that a son of Korah would write a psalm like this, a psalm that says it's better to be with God. Look with me together in Psalm chapter 84. It's a passage that's directly related to Psalms 42 and 43. If you want some extra homework, you could go read those and look into those. It's the psalm that expresses that same longing and yearning to be in the presence of God, that formal place of worship. Verse 1, it says, How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty, as some translations say it, but O the Lord of armies, how lovely is your dwelling place. See, I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh, they cry out for the living God. Even a sparrow finds a home and a swallow, a nest for herself where she places her young near your altars, Lord of armies, my King and my God. In verse 4, we'll stop here. It says this, How happy are those who reside in your house, who praise you continually. Verses 1 through 4 describe the psalmist's longing to be in the house of the Lord. He uses these sparrows, these birds here, as an illustration that they are 
sparrow is worth nothing, but yet they can be in the presence of the Lord. That's a beautiful picture for us here to know that we can be with the Lord if we've messed up in our life or we feel like we're a nothing, a nobody, that God doesn't look at us that way, that He sees us as His creation and, and that He longs to be in relationship with us. This first section here in Psalm 84, starting in verse 1, how lovely is your dwelling place. It's describing this person's pilgrimage to be with the Lord. If we could look at three quick things here this morning, we could see the pilgrimage to be with the Lord in verses 1 through 4. The pilgrimage to worship the Lord, not just to be with Him in His presence, but now adore Him and worship Him. And the pilgrimage to pray to the Lord, to reflect on what the Lord has done and who He is and the good things that He provides for His people. That's what we see here. We see this beautiful psalm about being with God. And we must ask ourselves the question today as we study this passage of Scripture. Is that our ultimate longing? Are we on that pilgrimage? Are we on that journey to be with God? That could be true for many different stages of our faith. Even pre-Christ, maybe some of us are here listening in and you don't know God and it's your sin that's keeping you from knowing God and you need that sin atoned for and forgiven. You just ask God to forgive your sin. You place your belief and trust in Jesus. You confess that He is Lord. He will meet you there. But maybe somewhere along the way, after you've gotten saved, you've gotten to these levels in your faith, if you will. You've memorized verses, you've shared your faith, you've served the Lord, you give to the kingdom of God. And along the way, you've thought that maybe you arrived and that you completed the, the game of life. And you've missed the whole point that it's not about this progression towards an ascent of some kind of arrival, but it's really about the journey with God. Yeah, you can grow in your faith. You can mature in your faith. But those who grow, those who mature, recognize and realize that it really is a lifelong journey of sanctification, and it's a, a journey of being with God. So for you, friends, are you on that journey? Is that the ultimate goal for you, is to be with God? Or have you been distracted by the distractions of this world? Have you been distracted by the things that will grab your attention away from God? You know, you can work, you can do school, you can be in relationships, you can play sports, you can do anything in this world, and you can still do all of that with God. They don't have to ultimately take you away from God. It's all about your perspective. Are you on that pilgrimage? Are you on that journey with God? Well, now let's look at verses 5 through 7, this pilgrimage to worship the Lord. Verse 5 says, Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of, and we want to say Baca out here, but it's the valley of Baca. They make a it a source of spring water in the autumn rain, and it will cover it with blessings. Verse 7 says, They go from strength to strength. Each appears before God in Zion. See, this passage here, verses 5 through 7, are describing the pilgrimage to worship God. This is a God who's worthy of our worship. The valley of Baca, that's a word that means weeping. So this is a valley of, of tears, of weeping here. And this person is allowing God to take them in the midst of their circumstance and shift them from the valley of weeping now to a place of springs. Verse 6 shows us that. As they go through that valley of weeping... They make it a source of spring water. This spring water is not from their tears. 
This spring water is from another source. It's from the Lord God. And that is why he's worthy to be worshipped. That is why he's willing to go on this pilgrimage to go worship God, to be with God. All throughout the scripture, we always see water, springs as a source of life. We know fully well that we need water to live and survive. If you've ever gone on a long distance hike or walk, or maybe you've just been hanging out in Albuquerque this week with extreme temperatures, temperatures like we're not used to, you know the importance of quenching that thirst with a nice glass of water. It's refreshing. It brings life. And so this psalm is is allowing God to turn the circumstances of weeping now to a circumstance of praise unto the Lord. It's now a place and source of life, the living water, the springs that are there. And verses 8 through 12, this pilgrimage to pray to the Lord, to talk with God. Verse 8 says, Lord God of armies, hear my prayer. And here's what the prayer is. Listen, God of Jacob, Verse 9 goes on to say, Consider your shield, God. Look on the face of your anointed one. Better a day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. I'd rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than live in the tents of wicked people. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord grants favor and honor. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. Happy is the person who trusts in you, Lord of armies. Oh yes, we see this coming full circle yet again. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. This concept of what verse 1 displays of this longing to be with God, longing to be in that one day moment, to be in that dwelling place of God. I remember when I was dating my wife and it was long distance and she was at Oklahoma State and I was in Albuquerque, New Mexico going to the University of New Mexico as we talked on the phone before Skype and FaceTime and Google Meets. I remember just longing to be with her in person. It was one thing to get a letter from her. It was one thing to get a message from her. It was one thing to get an email. Yeah, we send emails, yes. It certainly was one thing to hear her voice on the phone. Oh, but it was another to be in her presence. And I looked forward to those long drives from Albuquerque to Stillwater because I could be with my wife. Verse 8 here is this portrayal of a man who's saying, listen to my prayer, O God. My prayer is to just be with you. I need that longing fulfilled. I want to be in your presence. I want to experience your favor. I want to be with you, God. There are great blessings that we see here to be with the Lord, to be with God. In verse 1, we see that God provides lovely living with him. In verse 2, there's a yearning for him. That's a great term to, to long for and to yearn for something. That's a great emotion he's given us. We see we find a home with God in verse 3. In verse 4, we're happy at that home with God. In verse 5, we are happy when we're with God, not just at the home, but we're happy when we're with God. In six, we feel the refreshment of the springs of water. In verse seven, he gives us strength. That passage is from strength to strength. It's like from my strength to your strength. I need your strength, God. I need your refreshing. We are with a Lord who's a Lord of armies, verse eight tells us, that he is a provider and protector. Verse eight also shows us that he hears 
our prayer. Verse 9 shows us he's our shield. There's blessings to be with God. He's a protection for you. He's your shield. Verse 10 says that there's nothing better than to be with the Lord. No moment or experience is better than to be with the Lord. Verse 11 says he's our sun. He's our source of, of light and warmth. He is life. In verse 11, we see that he grants us favor. He also does not withhold good from us in verse 11. He gives us honor in verse 11. And that's why in verse 12, he can say, happy is the person who puts their trust in the Lord. Yes, or a, I believe a third time we see in this passage that those who dwell with God are truly happy. They're truly fulfilled. So the idea here today, the big idea is are you dwelling with God? Are you looking forward to our ultimate dwelling place? You know, the Bible teaches us that we're sojourners here on earth. We're travelers. This is not our home. This is a temporary dwelling place, like a tent that will be set up and torn down this is temporary. We went camping last week in the Pecos, and my wife gives me a maximum of two nights away from her bed if we're sleeping in a tent. She knows that her home is here in Albuquerque, that she won't be too far from it. We're sojourners here. Heaven is really closer than you and I think. Our life here on earth, it's but a mist. It's a vapor. It's a small small moment compared to eternity, but our home is in heaven. Our ultimate dwelling place is with God, as Revelation 21 tells us. So friends, do you long to be with the Lord? Do you have that desire in your heart? Do you long to worship the Lord? Is that desire present in your life on a regular basis? Do you long to talk to God, to pray to Him? If we could take anything from this psalm and this perspective that we've learned is that God wants to be with you. Will you be with Him? He's worthy of your praise and He'll listen to your prayers. Don't lose that longing. Keep it fresh in your life, day in and day out. Heavenly Father, we really do desire that, to keep that longing fresh day in and day out, that desire to be with you and to worship you and to pray, to be in communion with you, Lord. We want it. We need it. Lord, we look forward to it in heaven. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise God together. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own Brokenness and pain is all 